Greetings YouTubers, this is PhD Tony and today I'd like to talk about gravity and gravimetry. There is a lot of misinformation about gravity that is being promulgated on YouTube and much of it is based on a misunderstanding of the scientific process and how we determine what is scientifically valid. So I will start this video with a brief description of how scientific hypotheses are tested and developed. All scientific investigations start from the blue circle in this diagram. There exists some observable physical phenomenon we wish to better understand. We then design and develop instruments to precisely and accurately quantify the observable effects of this phenomenon. These instruments are then deployed in an observational campaign or experiment. The observational results thus obtained are then critically assessed in order to answer a number of questions. Are the instruments being used sufficiently accurate and or precise to meaningfully quantify the physical effect under investigation? Does our observational campaign or experiment need to be refined or re-performed to remove or minimize the effects of some unanticipated source of noise? If the instruments are sufficiently accurate and the observations obtained from our campaign are sufficiently noise-free, then these results may be analyzed from the perspective of theory. If our theory does not accord with the observed results, then the theory must be modified or refined. If the observations and the theory are in accord, then the theory must be developed in greater detail. The physical consequences and observable effects of this more detailed theory must then be itemized. The extended theory must then be observationally validated. This will require the development of new, more accurate instruments and more detailed and comprehensive observational frameworks. This cycle is repeated to produce a successively more accurate and profound understanding of the physical system being considered. The process of observation and quantification of physical systems is fundamental to science. The shrill and oft-repeated assertion that it is only experiment that provides a valid scientific framework is as fatuous as it is ignorant. It is one of the few universal truths of science that all mathematical formalisms are approximations and are almost certainly both incomplete and inaccurate. To be accepted, a refinement of a mathematical theory of a physical system must be consistent with all of the available observational evidence. As more observational campaigns are undertaken and the behaviour of the system is more precisely constrained, deficiencies in the theory may become apparent. These deficiencies will take the form of inconsistencies between the observational evidence and the theoretical predictions. When this occurs, scientists will work to refine, extend or improve the theory to better explain the newly available observational evidence. This does not mean that the old theory is useless and must be abandoned. It simply means that circumstances have been discovered in which that theory is no longer applicable. This is not the fault of the people who developed it, they were using the observational evidence available to them. No scientist can reasonably be expected to develop a theory that anticipates each and every piece of observational evidence that will ever be discovered. They're scientists, not psychics. When discussing gravity, flat earthers prefer to pretend that science works like this. Einstein was right, therefore Newton was wrong, and Newtonian theory is useless and can be discarded completely. In fact, our understanding of the theory of gravitation has progressed more in accord with the schematic presented in this diagram. Scientific investigation of the phenomenon of gravity commenced in the 16th century with the work of Galileo Galilei and Simon Stevin, who demonstrated that unsupported objects near Earth's surface experience a constant downward acceleration, independent of the mass of the object, but offset to some extent by air resistance. This basic observation still comprises the formulation for gravity employed in all fields of engineering and architecture. Were this theoretical estimate inaccurate, buildings and bridges would spontaneously collapse and planes would fall out of the sky. The fact that structures and vehicles are well able to withstand the forces applied to them suggests that this theoretical formulation of gravity is sufficiently accurate for most engineering purposes. Modelling the orbits of near-Earth satellites or planets within the solar system, however, requires that a more sophisticated formulation of the force of gravity be adopted. Following on from the meticulous observations of the motions of planetary bodies undertaken by Tycho Brahe and analysed by Johannes Kepler, Sir Isaac Newton was able to derive the universal law of gravitation. This mathematical formulation provides accurate results for any macroscopic non-relativistic system and remains sufficiently reliable that it is still widely used in many scientific applications today. 
By the late 19th century, however, it became obvious to researchers that the Newtonian theory of gravity was incomplete. In particular, astronomers noted that there were small discrepancies between the predicted and observed orbits of Mercury around the Sun. By 1915, Albert Einstein had developed the theory of general relativity and was able to make accurate predictions of the transit of Mercury across the face of the Sun as illustrated in the panel on the lower right-hand side of this figure. Einstein's theory explained gravitational force as the result of the distortion of space-time by mass. In 1919, Einstein's theory was further validated by the Eddington Eclipse Experiment, which observed distortions in the apparent positions of distant stars due to the gravitational effect of the Sun. Since this experiment, Einstein's theory of general relativity has been accepted as the most complete and accurate formulation of gravitation. However, our understanding of gravitation is still incomplete. The theoretical predictions of quantum theory and the theory of general relativity are not in agreement, which suggests that one or the other or both of these theories must be modified to reconcile them. The refinements required to bring these theories into agreement will be guided by the results of ever more elaborate and sophisticated observational campaigns. Which brings us back to our initial diagram. Successive refinements of our understanding of the theory of gravitational attraction have expanded our understanding of this phenomenon, but have not destroyed, replaced, or rendered obsolete our previous understanding. The emphatic insistence of flat earthers that we must abandon demonstrably accurate and thoroughly serviceable theory is symptomatic of their lack of understanding of how scientific investigation is undertaken. Having discussed uncertainty as it relates to theoretical underpinnings, it is now time to turn our attention to observational uncertainty. This diagram illustrates a succession of steadily more accurate techniques for determining the distance between two points. However, factors such as thermal expansion or contraction, instrument wear or refraction of light paths will result in errors in the obtained measurements. The potential magnitudes of these factors must be considered when determining observational uncertainty. When designing an instrument or an observational campaign, care must be taken to itemize, quantify and minimize the effects of any physical processes that might contaminate the results. While there are a great many physical processes that need to be considered in this context, the vast majority of them can be accurately quantified and are much smaller than our observational uncertainty, and may thus be neglected, such as the effects of relativity and quantum mechanics. In our current context, the primary effects that are considered are air resistance and electromagnetic forces. Much effort and great care is dedicated to minimizing the impact of these effects on observations. We now turn to the question of observational validation of Newton's law of universal gravitation. The earliest and most famous experimental validation of this theory was the Cavendish experiment. However, I'm not going to discuss this experiment in any detail here. Blue Marble Science is currently doing a fantastic recreation of this experiment and he will be discussing it in much more detail on his channel. I have provided a link in the description below. The next notable historical validation of Newtonian gravity is the Chehalian experiment coordinated by Neville Maskelin. In this experiment, plumb bobs were set up next to an isolated mountain and the deflection of the plumb bobs from the vertical was carefully measured. This allowed the lateral component of force applied to the plumb bobs due to the gravitational attraction of the mountain to be estimated. In recent decades, gravimetry has become a central component of scientific investigation. Gravimeters work by precisely and accurately monitoring the force applied to a test mass. In the schematic illustration shown here, this is done by observing the extension of a spring from which the test mass is suspended. There are, however, a number of alternative techniques for determining gravitational acceleration which will be considered in the following slides. The FG5 is an example of a style of gravimeter that uses repeated drops of a reference mass. During each drop, the trajectory of the reference mass is tracked by laser interferometry. Superconducting gravimeters such as the one illustrated here use a niobium test mass suspended in an electromagnetic field. Any force acting on the test mass will instantly induce a resistant current and the magnitude of that current can be used to measure the nature of the force applied. Cold atom gravimeters release small numbers of supercooled atoms into the test chamber. 
As they fall, the atoms are subjected to a series of laser pulses, and the phase differences between the atoms in the two collection chambers at the bottom of the instrument are used to infer the rate of acceleration. Gravimeters are commonly deployed in field campaigns to determine gravitational anomalies as a function of instrument position. These observational campaigns may be ground-based, aircraft-based, marine vessel-based, or borehole-based. Before being deployed in an observational campaign, mobile gravimeters are calibrated against measurements taken from a vastly more accurate reference gravimeter in a fixed location. The readings of gravitational acceleration at different locations may be used to compile a gravitational anomaly map such as the one shown here. Using the Newtonian theory of gravity, these gravitational anomalies are interpreted as subsurface density anomalies and may be used to hypothesize the location of subsurface mineral deposits. In the particular example shown here, the concentrated negative gravity anomaly is suggestive of a low density subsurface mineral deposit consistent with hydrocarbons. The accuracy and efficiency of gravimetric surveys in locating and identifying subsurface mineral deposits has led mineral exploration companies to invest very heavily in the instruments and software necessary to pursue this technique. Gravitational gradiometers use three pairs of widely separated accelerometers set orthogonally to one another. The difference in acceleration experienced by each pair of accelerometers allows the gradient of gravitational acceleration to be calculated for that spatial axis. Today, this technique is widely used in mineral exploration, but it was originally developed to allow submarines to passively detect underwater obstructions and avoid them. High-precision gradiometers were deployed on the European Space Agency's GOCHE satellite mission to directly observe Earth's gravitational field as shown here. Laser ranging measurements of intersatellite distances in the GRACE and GRACE follow on missions have been used to determine surface mass anomalies as shown in the lower panels. This latter technique was also employed by the GRAIL satellite mission to obtain observations of the lunar gravity field. None of these observational techniques or real world applications would be possible if the Newtonian theory of gravity were significantly in error. I have presented here only a tiny fraction of the scientific evidence that is available on the subject of gravitation and Earth's gravitational field. But even so, I think I have established beyond doubt that the flat Earth claim that mass does not attract mass is as ignorant as it is arrogant. Gravity is the attractive force that is demonstrably observed to apply between all matter. Yes, there are some aspects of the origin of this force that we do not completely understand as yet, but to use this as an excuse to claim that it simply doesn't exist is mendacious. To finish, I will address the claim that what we call gravity is actually relative density disequilibrium. This mechanism cannot be used to explain the lateral components of force detected in the Cavendish and Chehalian experiments. Relative density disequilibrium also fails to explain how a gradiometer on a submarine or a gravimeter in a borehole capsule can obtain meaningful measurements. Nor can it be meaningfully applied to the case of a massive object in a low-pressure system where the relative density can be made arbitrarily large. Nor can relative density disequilibrium be applied to the case of individual atoms or neutrons falling in isolated systems. Density cannot be meaningfully defined for these particles, yet they fall at a constant rate of acceleration under the effect of Earth's gravitation. In short, the relative density disequilibrium hypothesis is deranged nonsense. Well, that seems as good a note as any to finish on. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll hope to see you again next time.